The mission of the Inattentive ADHD Coalition is to ensure that children with inattentive ADHD are diagnosed by the age of 8 and that adults with inattentive ADHD receive prompt and accurate diagnosis when seeking help. To learn more about our mission and how you can help, visit iadhd.org. I'm Katherine Ellison. I'm a journalist and author. Today we're talking with Michelle Harris-Price. I would love to hear where where are you and tell us about she ADHD. I am in California, a little Uh, bit outside of San Diego in a little town called Marietta. She ADHD is a nonprofit that I set up last year for women who are diagnosed as adults. I discovered executive functions. I realized that two thirds of my life, I would say, not knowing that I had this condition, understanding that it's a condition of self-regulation, executive functions would have helped a lot. Other women need to know it. And I'd like to spread the word I wanted to share lived experience with each other. Have you started and doing that? Is it, is it up and running? We're on the, we're on the way. It originally started out as a way for women with executive function deficits to create content. Women with executive function deficits, we talk a lot about our stuff, but we have a hard time activating. How do you see this all coming about? How do you see women with ADHD sharing their experience? There was some sort of a podcast where there are categories of content. Chicken Soup for the Soul meets Women Entrepreneurs iTunes or something. I spent a lot of time on the internet as an internet marketer early in my career. One of the things that I'm really good at is platform, helping people build platform. I love authors, love experts. I love expertise. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that's helping women diagnosed as adults share experience with each other through conversation, through interviews. There's nobody addressing both economic and emotional issues related to ADHD. So that is probably going to be the focus. We're making it up. I don't have a problem with the vision and then seeing how to make the vision happen. That's exciting. I I definitely want to join. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Why not? Right? (laughs) You're already doing it. You've had a really interesting professional odyssey. You started out in healthcare, didn't you? I I did as an 18-year-old at the emergency room working the swing shift. (laughs) It's a good ADHD job. Lots of novelty and stimulation, right? It was. It was. I got married at 18. I what? didn't want to go to school. I thought school was like, screw this. I'm not going. I'm not doing that again. How did you get from there to here? How did you discover <laughs> your talent with platforms from work? Through my work in healthcare, I became a continuous improvement analyst. The healthcare organization I worked, I had already been there 10 years and I decided like, if I'm going to be here, I might as well make more money. I'd gone to my boss and I said, I want to be a trainer. They identified me as a high potential and sent me to team leader training, facilitator training. I left after 19 years. I discovered the internet. They call them special interest spins. I took the spin. I sat there and said, how are they making money online? How is this happening? This is 1999. The way that they were making money online was selling people like me information on how to make money online. I had information. I could figure that part out. Now, how do I sell that, I ended up selling my services as somebody who understood the internet to help authors sell more books online. It sounds like you've had a lot of confidence in your career. And yet you say you went two thirds of your life without knowing that you had ADHD. I was identified as highly gifted. So that was my identity. I could figure this out. I didn't know, but I knew I could figure it out. When you look back at your childhood, do you see any signs back then? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The earliest memory I, that stands out for me, I would start summer school every summer from the age of seven. I always wanted to go to summer school, but two weeks into it, I'd be done. My mother would let me quit. I'd never finish anything. That, to me, is the biggest indicator. I also was extremely sensitive. I was a crybaby. I was very sensitive very shy, very scared of people. That's, I call that the tism side. (laughs) I think I'm on the spectrum too. Not a little. What makes you think that? What makes you think that about you? The the extreme social anxiety 
the sensory issues. I'm very particular, specific about things. I'm very funny about my space and my boundaries. I can go ballistic about noise. <laughs> Sometimes it's not all the time. Apparently um, it's quite common to find them both together. What led to your um, diagnosis of ADHD? What was it? <laughs> my first client said, you have ADHD. And I looked at him <laughs> and said, what is he talking about? I, I was really perplexed because all I could think of was, what did I do that would make him think that I'm like a seven-year-old child bouncing off the wall? I didn't understand it. I'm not hyperactive, but, I, but I'm more hyper inside my mind. I literally don't know why he said that, but it led me down a rabbit hole and found Dr. Daniel Amen's website. Oh, wow. Was he the one who diagnosed you? No, there was a quiz on his uh -huh. site. It's like 2004. There was a question on the quiz that really broke through for me that made me think, maybe you do have this thing. Mm -hmm. It was a question about, do you feel a sense of accomplishment when you do something that other people consider ordinary, like paying bills on time? <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> that was the thing. That one question. Yeah. For me, but that was me. That was me. But you had been living with this, not finishing things and some other symptoms of ADHD. So when the client told you that he thought you had it, why didn't you just dismiss it? Why did you take him seriously? Because of who he was. Because of who he was. <laughs> the way that I met him was so out there, so extraordinary. I had already been on this journey of, of personal development. I just knew I just want to work from home with my mouse and my laptop. I met this lady and she knew him and he interviewed me and said, hey, I'd love to work with you. I said, okay. But he was very well off. He had been a thuggish person as a young person and ended up changing his life. He owned Remax of Indiana and had taken it from 75 real estate agents to 1,500 that sold $4 billion worth of real estate a year. The book that he wrote, I was really fascinated how he had done that. The things that I was learning from him, I really, and plus he had it. Oh, he so had to know. That's how, that's how he knew I had it. I'm sure he didn't identify with it. It's not that he identifies with it. He approaches it from a different perspective. Why don't you do the things that you know you should do? That's his approach to it. Let's get back to you, Michelle. So when you got diagnosed, after you looked at the Daniel Amen site, what was your next step? Did you get diagnosed by a psychiatrist? I, I, I did nothing. I did nothing with it for probably three years. I didn't do a thing. Nice. I've always been able to activate when I was still working. This, I read a book uh, called Strengths Finder, or Now Discover Your Strengths. Yeah. And it discovered my strength. As long as I'm doing what I'm strong in, what I'm good at, when I'm, I'm an activator, I'm strategic, futurist, those are some of my strengths. Are you yeah. saying the ADHD wasn't really a problem for you? Problem. Yeah. But it, I did not know that you could get medication for it. I hadn't gone that deep into it. I didn't know that there was such a thing. I, did, I didn't know. So, so three years later, you got diagnosed later. by a professional. And three years later, don't try this at home, folks. My <laughs> girlfriend gave me a Adderall. We were on our way to a workshop. She says, hey, try one of these. I'm like, Ooh, what is it? <laughs> she gives it to me. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. In my 20s, I self-medicated a lot and I just didn't want to get into that. And she's like, oh, girl, it's not going to hurt. So I take it maybe an hour later. It was like the Wizard of Oz when it goes from black and white to color. My brain is switched on for the first time. All I could think of was, is this what people feel like all the time? I wish it did that what? for me. I've heard that from some people. It was yeah. a small dose. Wow. Finally, I just said, I need to go get a diagnosis so that I can get my own prescription. And that's when my business really took off. I had some really good years, but until I did that, I didn't know that there was anything that I could take for it. That's fascinating that you could be better than you already were. I'm a woman, I'm black, you know, that what's out there? There's nothing really out there to tell me. That's one of the reasons I did start She ADHD Foundation. You get this diagnosis and then what? There's all this information. The ADHD hashtag has been seen on TikTok 80 billion times or something. Uh -huh. You've got everybody and their mother yeah. learns it. And they're giving you these memes and you're doom scrolling. And it's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's crazy. So when you got the diagnosis, were you doom scrolling? How did it feel to get the diagnosis? 
but I like, cried. I wasn't planning on crying. I wasn't emotional. I went to the University of California Behavioral Health Department and she took my questionnaire. I came back for the feedback session and she says, I have to tell you, you do have it. All of a sudden I just started crying because huh. it was like, oh my God, there was something wrong all that time. It just validated it. In my family, that was like, you don't have that. We don't have that. That's crazy. You're just a genius. That's what it is. My mother attributed everything to the fact that I had a high IQ. That's the reason I was so quirky. That's the reason I lost keys all the time. That's the reason I would leave my purse on top of the car. That's the reason I couldn't remember. You know what I mean? That yeah, was the yeah, reason. Of course, I do know what you mean. But I've heard is that there's a lot more stigma in African-American families. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's getting a little better finally with some things. Yeah. Bipolar, schizophrenia, for some reason, those are acceptable. Those seem to be more acceptable. But is it feeling like you're a crybaby or something if you say that you've got it? Oh my God, the sensitive. Yes, Shelly, she's sensitive. Yeah. That was, that was it. <laughs> I was though. I literally cried all the time. I cried mm-hmm. all the time. Everything. And now you don't? I have conditioned myself. I've, I'm getting better. I'm getting better at being able to show emotion. I'll do it when I'm by myself. Hmm. I won't do it around people. Yeah. And then, you know what? I never thought about it. It's probably related to that. Some things don't make me emotional. I'm a logical person. <laughs> I'm very logical. What do you call it? With the Myers-Briggs? I'm an NT. I'm a thinker. <laughs> I'm not a feeler. It's crazy making. It's crazy yeah. making, really. I, it sounds like you're doing a pretty good job, actually. <laughs> what besides taking medication, have you changed your life in any other way now that you know that you've got this thing? I wish I could say I ate really good food and that I sleep nine hours a night. And the thing that made the biggest difference for me is learning about the six clusters of executive functions. It's not eating better. It's not getting the sleep. None of that made the difference. For me, it was understanding there's that the reason sometimes I don't activate or I don't take action is related to these executive functions in that I can know it and not do it. The performance issue, that's made the difference for me. That's why I want to help other women understand that. Knowing it means that when you do something, you like, how does that work? You make a mistake and then you tell yourself, is it? It's not even makes a mistake when I won't get started, when I won't start, when I know I need to start and I won't do it. Yeah. Uh Yeah. When I looked at the six different functions, it was action, the executive function action. Getting out of your chair, like it's self-regulating action (laughs) and taking the action that you need to take. Mm -hmm. So monitoring, self-monitoring and actually getting into motion. I can activate easily. I don't have a plan. I'll get started, but I don't need to have a plan. I'll just get going. What stops me is, oh, I started in the middle. (laughs) It sounds like you're just saying that you're more aware of the way your mind works. And knowing these executive functions just helps you do a better job. They do. I also started listening to Dr. Russell Barkley, all of his lectures. Once I understood that it's a regulation issue, the fact that I don't self-monitor or I'm self-aware that I'm doing it. It's medical. And that's sexy to me. I like that. I like thinking about thinking. Yeah. I would just think all day. If I could just sit and get paid to think. <laughs> it sounds like you do a lot of that. When you look back at your life as a kid, do you think there was something a teacher could have seen in the classroom that maybe could have identified you as having ADHD? In the early years, no, I don't think so. I loved school. I yeah. loved school until I hit the 10th grade and geometry. At that point, what could have helped was if I could have had a a tutor for geometry, if they notice that in the classroom, she can do the work, but she's not doing the homework, her test scores are bad. If somebody could have noticed that, that would have been helpful. If they noticed that I never do the homework, but sometimes I I ace the test. I hated homework. I just wouldn't do it. What difference would it have made in your life if you had been diagnosed early on? Maybe I wouldn't have gotten married. Maybe I would have went to college (laughs) instead. I had scholarship offers. I've could have done that instead of got married and got a kid. I don't know. I could have been more consistent. One of the things that I did know about myself, even though I didn't know what it was until I was 44, is I was consistently inconsistent. Yeah, I was consistently inconsistent. I was afraid to put myself out there doing certain things because 
of what came with it. I knew I would have to perform if I did it. For example, it's a fear of success almost. I knew that sometimes I'm not consistent. I, I don't want to do something. I might want to do it today, but tomorrow I might not want to do it. That was fear of success. Maybe it's more fear of failure. Or- both. Well, both. It's both. Because success would mean that I'd have to be on. I'd have to continue to do. Uh-huh. That's a commitment. I, yeah. And has boredom been a problem in your life? Rarely. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm rarely bored. There's always something, especially with the internet. When I was about six, I was bored and it was rainy and I wanted my mother to get me a puzzle. She would not get me a puzzle. I was that <laughs> kid that would not leave you alone. My mother drew me a puzzle on some cardboard and cut it up and gave it to me. That's great. It was like you had a pretty cool mom. <laughs> oh, my mother was very cool. She understood. She was bipolar. And she had gotten her degree, the bachelor's degree in, in the 40s. And she's a mm-hmm. black woman. So she was very well. Yeah, she was very well. And she was an older mom. She didn't have me until she was 36. When you got your diagnosis and then talked to your family about it, did they treat it more seriously? No. They, they didn't believe it. Yeah, yeah. They didn't believe it. It's a difficult conversation to have. It wasn't in their realm. Nobody knows anything about it. Did, how did your mom mm-hmm. react? Did your mom take it seriously? She didn't believe it. Mm-mm. Oh, wow. Even with the bipolar. And did she talk about her own bipolar disorder? Oh, or? yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. My mother was interesting. She yeah. was actually part of the American Negro Theater. She oh. was very open with her mental illness. But not about yours. That's pretty not interesting. About mine. But I think I got it from her. Piece. It's from my mom. Na- I, mean, I can tell there, now. There is a relationship. Yeah, I know sure. that's where it came from. So, Michelle, I want to go back mm-hmm. to you said earlier, because it's sticking in my mind about crying when you got the diagnosis. Was it a relief? It was embarrassing. What were the words going through your mind? There really was something wrong. Yeah. It was relief. It was relief because I was looked at sometimes as a fuck up. Financially, I was always in a hole. Even though I had this job, I was impulsive. I would spend money on things. I had a good job. I was married. They had a job. But we, the money was never really right. I was always in a hole. That just seemed to be my default. What were you impulsively buying clothes? It was probably clothes. <laughs> just going out and eating. I would spend utility money. Spend on therapy because I, I, I had to spend a lot on therapy. No, I had a really good health care. Did, really did you get any therapy before you got diagnosed with ADHD? I actually did. I was in therapy for 11 months and I ended up leaving and getting a divorce, (laughs) but she didn't even pick up on it. Interesting. Uh She didn't pick up on it at all. What did she think the problem was or did she name the problem at all? One thing she did note was that as long as it was for my job, I was willing to come every week. But when it became about my relationship, I wouldn't come. I started coming every two weeks and then I don't really remember why I even went now. Isn't that crazy? You had married, it sounds like it was an impulse decision that you got married at 18. I got married at 18 because in the Black community, when you're 18, at least when I was young, you moved out your house. You went to the Navy, you got your own place, you got a job, you went to school. That was it. You didn't stay with your parents. I didn't want to live by myself. I didn't feel like I could live by myself. They say the mental age is, is a lot younger. And that's what I think it was. Mm-hmm. Emotionally, I wasn't. But I always felt older. It's cra- it's, like I said, it's crazy making. How's it affected your being a mother? How has how the ADHD affected that, do you think? I guess I was a fun mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that mother that laughs and jokes. Me and my daughters have a really good relationship. I think it's affected me. I was a young mother. I had a child at 19, almost 20, and then one at 25. But I did get my tubes tied after that. Like I'm not going to have any more. I knew I would do something crazy. That's even before I knew I had this. I said, are you going to tie your tubes? Because you're not going to meet some guy when you're like 40 years and decide to have a baby. That's not going to happen. Do you think your daughters might have inherited it? We've got four generations of ADHD. I've got two daughters, four granddaughters and a grandson. Oh my. (laughs) Yeah. We have that where she ADHD came from because it's Ebonics. We have a group chat when somebody's having a bad day. She ADHD. So you're much more open about it and and accepting than your mom might have been. Yeah. 
it was obvious. Once I found out that I had it, I identified it in my oldest daughter. It took probably two years to get her to see it and to seek treatment. I was very open with it once I figured it out because I could see that it had caused so many problems. Yeah, so many problems. It sounds like you've given them a gift from all the learning that you've done with it that you can pass on in a transparent mm-hmm. way. Oh, yeah, yeah, we joke about it. Yeah. You need to understand that there's a reason you feel rejected and sensitive more than other people right? If you know that, then you can create strategies or you can understand when it happens. It doesn't take you out. Now ADHD has become a central part of your work identity. I listened to an interview. Somebody was one of the people that you interviewed. When she described her inattentive symptoms, I realized those were the majority of my symptoms. What she said that made me realize it was that every night She had to watch the same TV program, fall asleep to the same, whatever it was. And I realized I do the same thing. I have a playlist and I play the same music every night, all Mm -hmm. night long. I realized I like that too. I hadn't ever paid attention to it. Wow. It wasn't silly, huh? right? I'm inattentive to my inattention. You're becoming more attentive every day. (laughs) I am. I am. But it's the absent-minded professor. (laughs) <laughs> that used to perplex people about me, my intellect preceded me. In the Black community in San Diego, there's only 6% Black in San Diego. My mother made sure everybody knew that, I don't know if she did on purpose, but people knew that I was really bright. Then I would say, the, I would do these incredibly dumb things. You know what I mean? So the incongruent. What's it, an example? What's an re- incredibly dumb thing you would do? An incredibly dumb thing I would do. Let's see. <laughs> Let me think. Let Things that would be completely obvious to other people. I'm not thinking of anything right now, but there are things that I do that people say, really, Michelle, (laughs) or you didn't know that? And I'm like, no, I didn't know that. They don't understand how I don't know. I think we've got a lot of great material for the interview. It's really been delightful to talk with you. When can we expect the She ADHD to be live? We're going to, I just launched a podcast with a woman named Stacey Michelle. She has a YouTube channel called ADHD is the New Black. And so she's co-hosting a executive function series with me that we're calling She ADHD Masterclass. That'll be in October. That'll be the first thing that we're doing. I'll be at the international conference. I have a session called the State of Women in ADHD. We're going to be talking about where we've been, where we've come from, where we are, and where we're going in a town hall format. Speaking of that, I have one last question for you, which is I saw a tagline somewhere, it might have been on your LinkedIn page, that said, not your mother's ADHD. (laughs) What do you mean by that? This ain't your mama's ADHD. Meaning that Ferrari with bicycle brakes, this isn't the slow lane. My mother wouldn't get on the freeway. She would hit the brakes. Instead of speeding up, I've always driven like this zoom, right? I've always been like that. (laughs) Unleash the Ferrari. Unleash the Ferrari. (laughs) Yeah. This isn't your mama's ADHD. I'm not going to, I'm not politically correct. I'm not that nice person. I can be, but I'm not known for that. I, I, I call my daughter and ask her sometimes, how does this, I need to say X. How do I say that? Because... I know that I'm not always the most diplomatic. You've done so. great on this interview, and it's really been a pleasure. <laughs> I want to thank you so much. Cynthia, do you have any questions? Uh, really thank you, Michelle. I'm just curious, when you talk knowing about you, the executive function challenges alone is enough to make a difference. Is that mm-hmm. what I understand? I named it the 80-20 rule of ADHD, the Pareto principle. The executive functions, these six that Dr. Brown identified, That's the 20% that causes 80% of the effect of ADHD. If people just understood that 20%, these six functions, if if, if we had some way to assess which of these six is causing the most for you. Let me ask you, Michelle, if you knew about the executive functions Mm -hmm. and you continued to be unmedicated, Mm -hmm. could you make the changes you're talking about? They would be super hard, but I would. With my personality. Determination. 
Yeah, with my personality, it would make a difference. I don't know that I could always follow through. Mm-hmm. Medication, what I read an article by Russell Barkley the other day that said medication is the is the only thing that can address the underlying neurological or neurobiological issue. So it's the only sure thing. When you talk about the executive functioning helping you, the medication is in there underlaying your ability to make so much use of knowing. The medication opens the portal for me. It opens the metacognition, my ability to to see myself in the moment you're not saying to people that if you know the EF alone, oh, no. it's going to make a huge difference. The medication made all the difference for yeah. me. That was the original door opener for me. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know you could have medication. A lot of people say knowing they have ADHD makes a difference. Just knowing that makes a difference to them because they learn to forgive themselves more. They uh, stop shaming themselves. You're saying... Learning about executive function is a different level of learning. It is. Understanding how it's related to self-regulation and that you are inclined to not be as self-regulating as other people. I could say I'm not going to eat this whole bowl full of popcorn, but then I eat it. (laughs) You might not even be hungry, but it's there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You're just going to eat it. (laughs) it. Literally. Stop it, Han. Stop it. Stop. (laughs) I was throwing stuff away. Like, oh. Just get rid of it. Throw it in the trash. <laughs> rid of it. It's very frustrating. You feel like you have a willful child <laughs> trying to manage a willful child. <laughs> exactly. It's crazy. It's crazy making. And that's why I cried because I had been shamed by my fam- my brother. I was always looked at. Like, What's wrong with you? Mm-hmm. You lose this. You always, this is going on. I just remember that being in the back of my mind. When she said that, and it was like the faucet turned on, I was raised that I was smart. I interviewed one woman who qualified as a gate scholar, and she Mm -hmm. said that made her ADHD worse because then people said, you're so smart. Why are you so dumb? <laughs> so it's you have like, so much potential. You look, you look worse because you're smart. <laughs> you have so much potential. Yeah. That's but right. you're not meeting your potential. I hate hearing that. Yeah. You have so much potential. Yeah. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Well, What's wrong with you? You didn't talk about grieving. And some people grieve the life they missed. You don't mention that very much. Yes, you did. You said you might not have married. You might have gone to college. So there were things that you think yeah. you missed out on because you didn't have the earlier diagnosis. Yeah, that hasn't come. That hasn't been a part of it until recently for me, like maybe the last year. Yeah, that I thought did about. Did something, something inspire that? Because what you got diagnosed three years ago, did you say? No, I got diagnosed 11 lot, years ago. Uh, yeah, I was so 44. Usually the grieving comes right with the diagnosis. Something's bringing it up <laughs> now, huh? You wish you had more money in the bank. That's what it yes. is. Yeah. That, and maybe I should have stayed married. You know? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, there are those things. You regret some of your impulsive decisions. <laughs> so- Girl, so much. I I literally think that sometimes, but it's my road, right? This is my path. Yeah, got to right. make it. And the best thing is to learn to accept what you, what is and not keep wishing for what isn't. The thing that helped me with that was a book called The Science of Getting Rich. Mm-hmm. I found that book in 1999 on the internet. I read it and I really took it to heart. And pretty much it just says, you got to act now. You can't act yesterday and you can't act tomorrow. Ah. You have to act right now. Whenever I start to get a little squirrely, I'll go back to it and reread it and remind myself, ground me. Well, that's opportunity. good for ADD too, because the, the, our two times now or not. Now. Those are our times. If it's now and you don't get to do it now, then yeah. it becomes not now and you never know when now is going to come again. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah, it's thank you. Thank really you. Great to meet you. Take care. <laughs> See you. Bye. Bye. This has been a production of Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Check us out at iadhd.org and see how you can help us by donating or by spreading awareness about inattentive ADHD. Thank you.